back to One Hit Wonderland, where we take a look at bands and artists known for only one song. I'm still, uh, still doing those requests. And yes, I did promise you something a little raunchier than the twee cutesy song I did last time. Well, here you go. You know, I can't believe this is the first time I've covered an Australian band on One Hit Wonderland. <laughs> this means I finally get to bust out my Australian accent and say some of my favorite Aussie phrases like Good day, mate, and that's our knife, and I masturbate frequently. Oi! The Australian band I'm covering is The Divinals, who had their one hit in 1991. Which, as I've said before, was a weird, weird year. The 80s were over, but the 90s hadn't really started yet. It was the weirdest of all in mainstream rock, which developed a whole vibe that existed for only that year and would be dead and gone once the grunge revolution set in. And okay, I may have overhyped how dirty this request is going to be. But even for the time, it was kind of dwarfed by whatever Madonna was doing in 1991. I mean, it's just female masturbation. It's, you know, she's just, she's... You know, I'm discovering I'm really not comfortable talking about, about, you know, this. And it's, I don't know why, it's not like I'm unfamiliar with the concept. I have the internet. But even though we in America only know them for their shameless ode to solo sex, there's so much more to this band than just an Aussie chick tossing some shrimp on her Barbie. I hate myself. But yeah, there's a lot more to them actually, so let's check them out. There are basically three kinds of artists I cover on One Hit Wonderland. They were A, not good enough to have a second hit, 2, too weird to have a second hit, or 3, actually good artists that just happened to line up with the popular zeitgeist for one single moment. And usually they're a big deal in their home country if they're foreign. You have to be kind of respectful for that last one, so it's, it, it's the hardest one to talk about. Especially if their subject matter already makes you kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. But anyway, yes, the Divinals are the real deal. Let's start at the beginning. The Divinals are two people, lead singer Chrissy Amphlett and guitarist Mark McEntee, and a bunch of rotating other guys. One of the original members was previously the bass player for Air Supply, so, <laughs> gee, wonder why he didn't fit in. Still waiting for my ship to come in. Anyway, Chrissy and Mark met here in Sydney, Australia. And I didn't just pick this as a generic picture of Sydney, I mean specifically, right there, the Opera House. McEntee first saw Amphlet performing at the Opera House with a church choir. I don't think I Touch Myself had been written yet, but if it had, I'm sure it's what they would perform. They released their first album in 1982, a soundtrack for a movie called Monkey Grip. It's about a psychotic killer monkey that terrorizes a post-apocalyptic Australian wasteland. I don't know what this movie's about. But I like the songs from it. Musically, this band reminds me of The Pretenders a lot. Not the least because Chrissy Hind and Chrissy Amphlet are pretty similar looking women with the same first name. Same hair, even. But the Divinals, I think, never really lost their punk edge the way the Pretenders did. The Pretenders were always kind of mainstream. The Divinals were a little more new wave. And they were pretty popular in the US on the college circuit, too. Hey, little boy, you don't have to hide nothing no more. And they seem to have been pretty consistently popular in Australia. Not like huge pop stars or anything, but, you know, they had a few hits. And, as you can see, Chrissy Amphlett was not shy about playing up the sex angle from the very beginning. Which is not to say she was just another pop music pinup. She was a lot more confrontational than a Britney Spears. Although, like Britney, she did like wearing school uniforms. Much like Australia's most famous band. Although it looks a little better on her. Also, when she wasn't on tour with the band, she did a little theater work in Australia, too. Christina Amphlett is sensational. I only mentioned because I wanted to share this clip. Alright, right, hold it, freeze it. Blood Brothers. Recognize him? 
Yep. Never forget, all Australians know each other. Next time you meet an Australian, just ask them what Margot Robbie is like and they'll tell you. Anyway, after three successful underground albums, Amphlet was poised for stardom, and the vinyl started attracting attention from major labels looking for the next Madonna. Clearly, she had the charisma, but could she pull it off? Yeah, there's not a lot of build-up to the whole masturbation thing, is there? I love myself. Not only is it in the title and the hook, it's the first line. I search myself. Considering how uptight we always are about sex, and certainly that was true in 1991, you'd think a song this blunt about female sexuality would be pretty controversial. Was it though? Honestly, from what I can tell, not really. MTV certainly played this around the clock. I couldn't find anything about it being banned anywhere. Which, you know, actually doesn't surprise me. If anything, it's pretty tame for a hot lady in a short dress and fishnet singing about touching herself. Monocle stayed rested comfortably on people's faces when this song came on. I can think of lots of songs about self-pleasure. Tons. I've talked about some of them before, but they're all by guys. Songs about girl masturbation are much rarer. There's the She-Bop, which you might not even know is about that if you're not listening closely. And there's... Actually, is that it? I, I think it might be. Actually, I think I know why I'm not comfortable talking about this. There's, there's just no good euphemisms for it. I mean, all the songs about dudes jerking off, at least tend to cover it in metaphors or be a little coy about it. If you're a chick, though, there's not really a whole lot of clever words. There's, I guess this song didn't really have a choice except to just lay it out there. I mean, just bam, I touch myself. But if I haven't made clear, yeah, this song is still awesome. And it's not just a song about touching yourself. It's a song of seduction. She wants you to know that she touches herself thinking of you. When I think about you, I touch myself. That is exclusively a female privilege. You cannot be a guy and just go, Hey girl, I jerked off thinking about you in the shower this morning. <laughs> well, go on, big boy. I, I that's, that's what she's saying, and like, you can't deny she's killing it, right? There's no way this wasn't going to be a hit. On top of that, she looks great. I mean, she's not a model or anything, but the camera still loves her. For that, you can thank the video director, a young up-and-comer named Michael Bay. Which, you can kind of tell, right? There's a, there's a lot of his trademarks in there. But really, you'd have to be really uptight to object to this. I mean, it's so happy, it's almost innocent. Okay, yes, it is still kind of dirty, but who cares? And I really do feel this song could have only happened in 1991. Not because of the subject matter, just because of the style. Like, we had this idea of what sexy was in music that year. You know, guys wore bugle boy jeans and cowboy hats. The music has this kind of desert twang to it. Like what the Divinals are rocking here. I have listened to the entire Divinals discography, and they never had a groove as tight as this. And I've given most of the attention to Chrissy, but Mark McEntee's guitar work is so good on this song. But yeah, mostly I think the big factor in this song's success is that she's singing about what she's singing about. Oh, did she just say that? She doesn't really touch herself, does she? Okay, I guess she does. But what else does she do? Okay, this is their follow-up Love School, which is not the name of a VH1 reality show. Yet. I don't want anybody else. That's not part of the actual song, they just added that for the video. 
And no matter how many times I see something like that happen on the show, it will always, always stink of insecurity. It's like saying out loud, yes, please remember our first song, because we know this one could never become a hit on its own. Which it didn't. I guess this song isn't terrible, but it's just not something very memorable. Honestly, I think it's one of the weaker songs on the album. I don't know why it was the follow-up. And she is working it extra hard in this one. I mean, she was always in control of her image from the very beginning. It wasn't like it was foisted on her, but it, it does seem like she's trying maybe a little too much at this point, right? Right, am I right? Anyway, I like the third single a lot better. Make out all right. And it did all right. It's a lot more fun than Love School, at least. It's got a groove to it. One that, for some reason, I can only think of as Australian. Like, whatever Australian rock sounds like, it is this. But it didn't really catch on here, nor in Australia, nor anywhere else. See, that's the problem with having your first hit song be about masturbating. The thing about masturbation is, once you're finished, you feel sad and gross, and you want to forget everything about it. But, since they had this big international audience all of a sudden, their next album was a compilation album of all their old hits. Plus a handful of new singles that were all covers. Even in 1993, we did not need any more covers of Wild Thing. Well, they, uh, they only released one more album ever. Didn't do very well. But she got that dog. By this point, it was 1995, and the landscape had changed so dramatically that it was difficult to imagine any way the Divinals could have fit themselves in. But in the age of Alanis, Hootie, Green Day? No, the Divinals would forever be confined in 1991. Of course, a part of it might be that at this point, Amphlet was drinking pretty heavily. I'm only human. Also, she and McEntee had a pretty volatile relationship. By which I mean, yes, they were sleeping together, and yes, they were fighting pretty constantly at that point. And so, the band just kinda gave up and called it off. In the meantime, Chrissy went back to theater. She played Judy Garland in The Boy From Oz. She also got married to one of the band's drummers, Charlie Dayton, who you might know better for this. Yeah, before he was in the Divinals, he was in the B-52s. Another band who built up a cult following in the 80s, broke through in the early 90s, and then disappeared. Chrissy and Mark didn't talk for a long time, but in 2006 they reunited for a brief tour after being inducted into the Australian Music Hall of Fame. I'll never forget the first time I saw the Divinals, led by the charismatic Chrissy Amphlett. See, I told you, everyone in Australia knows each other. Unfortunately, in 2010, Amphlet was tragically diagnosed with breast cancer. Would it be tasteless if I made a joke about touching yourself to check for breast lumps? That'd be out of line, wouldn't it? I'm, I'm sorry. And now stars like Olivia Newton-John are hoping to encourage women to do self-exams through one of the band's hit songs. Oh, okay, I'm good. <laughs> Phew. Anyway, Amphlet also had multiple sclerosis, so she couldn't receive chemotherapy, and she passed away in 2013. A truly sad day for an underappreciated icon of Australian music. Yeah. Did they deserve better in the sense of, did they deserve more than one hit song? Yeah. But they were a cult band through and through. They just weren't a band that could be appreciated by the mainstream, but they are still considered one of Australia's best rock bands if their Hall of Fame induction is an indication. But even if they had only ever had this one song, they'd still be great. Just a solid guilty pleasure about guilty pleasuring yourself. The Divinals. They touched themselves. They also touched all of us. <laughs>